Ladies, gentlemen, others, uh, it is my distinct honor to welcome Chris Alger and his teaching assistant, Captain Tuttle, uh, mm -hmm. the tuxedo cat. And perhaps we will even have the peanut gallery of Fritzy, the Australian shepherd, uh, commenting from time to time in case somebody walks near their house. Uh, Chris is a master naturalist uh, from the southwestern Virginia region near a, a town called Big Stone Gap, which I have not been to, but it sounds pretty uh, picturesque. Uh, he has all kinds of hobbies in his retirement. Uh, he used to work as a mathematics instructor at a community college and uh, has been enamored uh, of studying insects for about 70 years. So uh, thank you for agreeing to share some of this 70 years of knowledge and experience with the rest of us and take it away, Chris. All righty, let me bring up my program. All right, I'll close this window so it doesn't block my screen. Well, thank you. I'm very appreciative to be able to come for you all the way from the other end of the state. Um, I understand you are uh, interested in art and are doing things with flora and fauna this month. So I'm very happy to, to share and maybe inspire you. My goal is to uh, help you see what dragonflies and damselflies are about and maybe learn to appreciate the amazing diversity uh, and beauty of these uh, insects. Most of the photographs uh, are mine. A couple I borrowed from a couple friends, but uh, one thing I really enjoy uh, is uh, hiking around far southwest Virginia looking for a variety of insects. And uh, dragonflies and damselflies are some of the most spectacular and interesting insects I think uh, uh, that we have. So let's go to some things, a little bit of science. Uh, just for the, those of you that are into the nomenclature uh, classification, they are animals. Uh, they're in a phylum called arthropods, um, and they are basically insects, which means they have uh, six legs, uh, three body parts, head, thorax, and abdomen. Uh, the order of insects uh, is known as odonata. That includes two groups, dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, there are a lot of myths. I don't know what your knowledge uh, is of these insects. A lot of people think insects are basically creepy and uh, aren't uh, maybe great fans of them like I might be. But there are a lot of stories that, that you may have heard over the years about dragonflies. Um, one is that dragonflies can, will sew your ears shut while you sleep. Uh, there are some dragonflies that are called darners, and I think that comes from the shape of their bodies, uh, maybe resembling knitting needles. So I don't know if that uh, is a reason for that myth. Uh, they look kind of scary, maybe to some pe people, and a myth is that dragonfly stings are horribly poisonous. Uh, another myth that they are in league with the devil um, fishermen will often say if a dragonfly is present, the fish will not bite. That is not true. Uh, dragonflies are said to represent supernatural beings, should be left alone at all costs. All of these are falsehoods, uh, fake news, if you would. Here are some facts. Dragonflies don't sting or bite. They don't have a stinger. Uh, now, they might try to bite if, if you try to grab one and uh, they might get a little defensive. Uh, but basically their sharp teeth are used to feed on other insects. They're beneficial in that way. They are fierce hunters. Uh, their flight is amazing and they grab their prey in midair uh, with their feet. They don't carry any diseases or germs un unlike some insects that uh, we know about. So. Those are all very positive things to know. And one of the best things, dragonflies, one of their favorite foods are flying little gnats and mosquitoes. A dragonfly can eat hundreds of mosquitoes in a single day. Not only the adults feed, but the larval form of dragonflies, which live in the water, often will feed on mosquito larvae. 
And so they are benef very beneficial to the uh, uh, food chain in that respect. Uh, their flight patterns are amazing. They can hover, they can go straight up, straight down, side to side, uh, incredible flight. They also have incredible vision in order to capture prey that's flying through the air. They must be able to see remarkably well. And their compound eyes uh, make up most of their heads. As you'll see in some of the photos, they can see in every direction except right behind them. Um, ancient dragonflies from fossil records show some similar insects to dragonflies that had wings that were two feet across. Now that might be scary uh, because again, these are predatory insects and uh, we can be thankful, I guess, that our dragonflies are uh, much, much smaller. A little bit of anatomy here. Uh, the three body parts are head, thorax, abdomen. That's true of, in, of insects in general. Uh, the legs, uh, three pairs of legs and the wings are attached to the thorax and controlled there. Um, the, uh, the wings are kind of remarkable, the, the veins, and we'll see a variety of colors to them. But one recent discovery about dragonfly wings that I find interesting is that the structure of the wings have antibacterial or antimicrobial properties. Uh, they, they seem to uh, repel uh, bacteria and microbes. And engineers are now looking at trying to adapt similar structures and try to create products that take advantage of that fact uh, in, in field of medicine. Uh, so that's a recent uh, uh, discovery about dragonfly wings. And uh, there's some research going on to try to create products that can um, copy the structure of their wings. Um, a little anatomy uh, between the two, I'm not gonna go into this a whole lot at this point. On the left, you see a dragonfly. Uh, generally, they have thicker bodies, they're larger than damselflies. Uh, they hold their wings stretched out from their bodies, in most cases with their at rest. Uh, their compound eyes, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, lower part here, they, oops, went on. Wrong thing there. Um, you see how large the eyes are, and the eyes almost touch, or in some case do touch. Uh, over on the right, you see uh, damselflies. They are more slender um, and much smaller in general size. And notice the eyes are separated, um, and that's one of the ways to distinguish. The other one is that most damselflies at rest fold their wings along. Their, their body kind of parallel uh, covering the abdomen. Uh, although there are a couple exceptions that we'll see of damselflies that do uh, fold their wings outward like dragonflies. Um, life cycle is fascinating. Most insects go through some type of metamorphosis. Uh, the, the process here is uh, females will lay eggs uh, and the at the bottom there, you see a larva, doesn't look at all like a dragonfly. These can live in the water for three months up to five years. On average, maybe two to three years, most of the dragonfly's life is spent underwater where they feed on whatever they can catch. Uh, when they're very small, they'll feed on other tiny insects. Again, the mosquito larvae are favorite food. Though as they grow, they shed their skins. Um, as they get larger, they might be able to, some of the larger varieties could possibly feed on a small minnow or fish or tadpole. Uh, they are fierce hunters. Of course, there are other things, bigger fish will want to eat them. So uh, it's, a, it's a jungle down there under the water as things go on. Once they reach a certain stage and large enough, they crawl out of the water up on a plant stem. Sometimes they'll crawl over to a tree or whatever, climb up and then they shed their skin. Uh, it's a long process, kind of like a butterfly coming out of a chrysalis. Uh, they come out and expand their wings. Uh, and, uh, after, and it takes a few days before they finally completely dry out and, and uh, get their true colorations. Uh, when they are adults, 
Again, they fly around fast flying. They can be seen near the water. Sometimes they venture away from the water. Uh, they'll live one to eight weeks as adults. Uh, the mating, we've got some photos uh, showing that. A very interesting process. Uh, they form what's called a wheel formation. The male will clasp the female behind her head, and then she brings her abdomen back around to just below the thorax, and that takes the uh, uh, sperm from the male at that point. And um, one of the, the more interesting things to see is this very unique uh, mating process that uh, these insects have. Here's a simple little diagram of the four stages. Again, stage one, the eggs uh, usually laid in the water. Sometimes they're laid on plants that where the, the larva will drop out of the water. Uh, here's a very strange looking uh, larvae, uh, sometimes called a nymph or a naiad. Um, then they come out of the water, climb up on the stem and shed out of that and expand out their wings and become the uh, beautiful adults that we see flying around. So it's interesting, only about a few weeks of their life will be as an adult, several years will be as these creatures that are crawling around in the bottom of the pond or stream um, uh, developing to eventually become an adult. We'll start with some examples of damselflies. In general, they are smaller than dragonflies. Uh, slim bodies and fold their wings along the body. Uh, they've been around for a long time. They're found on every continent except Antarctica. Um, in North America, 135 different species. Virginia probably has about uh, maybe uh, 60, 70 different species, uh, 300 or 3,000 species worldwide. Uh, one of the best known and most often seen damselflies is this lovely ebony jewel wing. Uh, they get their name from the black wings. Uh, these are kind of large for damselflies and the male pictured here has a very iridescent abdomen that will refract light. That's not pigment blue that giving it that color. That's the actual physics of the light striking it from different ways. And they will vary in coloration from a blue to a blue green. Uh, very beautiful when the light hits them just so. Also their eyes will refract some of the light and sometimes have that blue or greenish tint to them. Um, it's one of my favorites to find. Uh, uh, they should show up reasonably early uh, in uh, mid spring or so. Uh, here's the female. Uh, as in many animal species, birds, for example, females most of the time are drabber and not as brightly colored. And that's to protect them because they are so important in terms of the propagation of species and being able to lay the eggs. And so uh, in Jenny C, she has the black wings, uh, but doesn't have the bright refractive coloration on her abdomen. Uh, and all this is about, uh, this was in our backyard a few years ago. We live about uh, three blocks from a river. So she's traveled a little ways uh, to go into our yard, probably hunting some insects. Uh, one characteristic of these species that you know, it's a female, notice the white tips up here on the tips of the wings. Uh, that is a marking that this particular species has, makes it easy to identify uh, the females. Uh, here's a male, sometimes when they're at rest, they'll flash their wings and it gives you a bright flash of color, uh, probably uh, marking their territory, letting other males know they're around, or maybe uh, hoping to attract uh, a female. Again, lovely colorations uh, when the sun hits them at that point. And here is a mating wheel. I uh, got this last year. I was real excited to uh, see this. My wife and I were hiking on a little trail up in the town of Appalachia, uh, Virginia. Uh, it's an old, uh, used to be a railroad track that's been converted now into a nice hiking trail. And uh, we saw this little pair flying in tandem and I was saying, please plant, land someplace where I can get a photo. And sure enough, they landed and I was able to get uh, a nice photo of the mating wheel. Again, the male here has curved his abdomen around and they have specialized claspers that they use 
at the tip of their abdomen to clasp the female behind her head. If she's receptive, uh, she will then curl around her abdomen. And at this point, there's a transfer of a sperm packet um, to the female from the male at that point. Um, just uh, amazing. Uh, if you can get the right angle, you can see they almost form a heart shape. And that's one of the, the, the goals of uh, Odin photography is uh, uh, trying to uh, capture uh, that process. I think it's an amazing process to uh, witness and see. Uh, a few weeks later, uh, these are females that I found along the Powell River in Big Stone Gap, just a few blocks from my house. And I was amazed to see about five female uh, that were all clustering around the water. And I figured out, well, they're laying their eggs. They found an ideal spot and they are ovipositing or dropping their eggs into the water. And I watched about half an hour. There were five of them that kept coming around to the same spot along the shore of the river uh, to... Uh, to lay their eggs. It was fascinating to see. I was just there at the right place and the right time uh, to uh, capture that uh, item. Um, oops, there, there we go. Uh, some other damselflies, uh, there's a group that are known as dancers. They come out around late June through July, at least uh, here in our mountains when I first start seeing them. Um, they are smaller, much smaller than the um, jewel wings that we just saw have the characteristic uh, wings that uh, are clear with the vein patterns. This is a blue fronted dancer. Uh, you can see where it gets its name. Uh, pretty, pretty uh, male uh, at this point. Again, the females don't have the striking blue coloration in most cases. Uh, here's another one. Uh, they seem to like to land on pavement along our hiking trail as we, as we walk along the green belt. Uh, you'll often see them dancing around, uh, fl flying and landing, and males uh, patrolling their territory. I got this picture, and then when I looked at it a little bit later, I realized there's something in its mouth. Uh, it has captured some kind of little flying critter. I don't know what, but you see there's a little thing there that uh, it, it did find a little meal uh, and is enjoying the, its, uh, its uh, dinner at that point. Um, here's a photo that I saw something fly and land in a pile of leaves. And um, so I just snapped a picture thinking there's something in there. Uh, can you look and see there is a dancer somewhere in that photo um, amongst those leaves? Give you a little time to focus on it. Maybe some of you can, can see it. Uh, look around. Uh, eventually, I did find it. It's on the bottom here. It's on the lower section. I'm circling right here, right in the center, uh, lower section. You see that. And uh, I was able to get on my hands and knees and crawl up a little bit. And luckily, it didn't fly away. Uh, with their great vision, they are sometimes very hard to uh, get photos of these things. Uh, and here she is. This is the blue fronted dancer, uh, the female, uh, not quite as vivid blue as the male. Uh, was. I had to get some help to identify this when I was learning these. Uh, I'll share some of my guides and some of the things, but uh, identification of some of these is tricky. There are a lot of uh, dancers that can look alike, especially females are often hard to, to identify. Uh, here's kind of a gruesome little scene, but it points out uh, how ferocious these delicate creatures are. This is a blue fronted dancer uh, found this last year. It's on a blade of grass there. You can get the idea of the size of it. And it's captured and has already decapitated another type of dancer. Uh, I'm thinking this might be a variable dancer. I can't be for certain on it. Uh, but um, they will feed on other odonates if they can catch them, if they're hungry enough. And uh, I don't witness this very often, but this is kind of striking to see that this this fellow had captured uh, another species and was uh, uh, making a meal of it. Uh, here's a beautiful coloration of a variable dancer. Uh, the, the males have this violet and blue coloration. 
Uh, this is taken at Natural Tunnel State Park in Scott County. Uh, here's another variation of the same color, the variable dancer. Their colors can vary somewhat uh, and uh, beautiful coloration. One thing I've learned is that you can find just about any color of the rainbow if you search long enough for the various uh, dragonflies and damselflies. And uh, this one was flexing its wings at the time, uh, kind of unusual pose, but I was able to get snap a picture just the right time uh, for it. Here's a close up of that variable dancer we saw earlier showing up close. They're kind of mean looking. Uh, uh, you can see the ferociousness from far away. They look delicate and 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 all. And of course, they fly so gracefully and all. But you can see up close. Uh, that's kind of a mean looking dude there. Uh, he's been around for a while also. He's uh, definitely uh, um, been out and about, maybe had a few tussles uh, for the last uh, few weeks or so. You can see the grasping legs. If you look closely, the little claws on the legs help them grasp prey that they uh, catch in the air and feed on. Again, mostly small gnats, flies, uh, small flying insects are their uh, food. Uh, so they're constantly flying around trying to see what they can they can uh, catch. They'll they'll sit there and if something flies by, they'll take off after it. Uh, here's a variable dancer female, uh, very pretty uh, 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 coloration, a tan coloration on it. Again, they blend in more with the landscape probably as a camouflage to give the females a little bit more uh, protection. But lovely coloration on on this one. Uh, here is a tandem pair of variable dancers. Again, you can compare the male uh, has the blue and purplish colors, brightly more brightly colored. The female, uh, the browner colors. Uh, they may have already mated or they may be in the process of getting ready to mate. Uh, you don't know when you find a tandem like this because after mating, the male will often continue to grasp the female to protect her from other males. He doesn't want another uh, gentleman coming in and uh, uh, to his lady friend. And also the, some species will actually guide the females to locations where they can lay their eggs. Uh, so they often stay in tandem like this after mating. Uh, other dancers, this is a powdered dancer, gets its name from the powdery white uh, coloration on its abdomen. Uh, here's another one, uh, very pretty. Again, these are very slender, very small. You've got to have really good eyes to actually see them. If they're just resting there, uh, you'll miss them. Usually you'll see them fly and land. Uh, and then I try to carefully sneak up on one uh, and uh, try to get a photo. Um, bluets are found around streams and moving water a lot. Uh, this is a double stripe bluet. It has the double stripes are the markings here on its on its abdomen. Uh, this is quite a ways out over the water on the tip of this plant that's actually growing up out of a pond and um, taking quite a distance. You need a telephoto lens or, or a camera that can zoom quite a distance to get some of these photos. Uh, here's a mating wheel of a turquoise bluet. Uh, again, this was way far out over the water. I wasn't able to get a position to uh, get a clear picture of the heart-shaped form by uh, the mating wheel. Uh, in fact, I was just felt I was very lucky to even get this photo of so far away at the time um, from the shore. Um, this was taken by a friend of mine, uh, an extension agent that lives right across the border in Kentucky. Uh, and uh, this is an azure bluet, uh, beautiful, beautiful blue color, very striking when they're out in the sun and light hits them. I think a lovely, lovely insect. Uh, and um, fork tails are another form of damselfly. They're some of the smallest damselflies you run into. These are extremely uh, tiny. Uh, this is this known as a fragile fork tail. Uh, it's one that is fairly easy to identify most of the time because of the marks on the top of the abdomen. Uh, you get this long yellow bar with a space and a smaller, looks like two exclamation points. 
is the way the field guides describe this particular one. And it's a reasonably common uh, damselfly uh, found throughout the state. Uh, here I've got one, you can see the relative size of it. I'm holding it between my thumb and forefinger. Uh, you can see they're not very large. And again, the uh, exclamation points there are very, very clear uh, on the uh, thorax uh, there. Um, they, if you're careful, I've, I've netted this one, took it out carefully, and then released it. It flew away uh, unharmed and all. Uh, another fork tail, equally small, is the eastern fork tail. They're found throughout uh, the east coast, uh, pretty common little damselfly. Um, again, on a little blade of, of a plant. Um, and here's one of the tiniest ones. I remember getting this photo. Uh, it was, it's on a little stalk of a grass seedling. And this is early morning. It was still kind of damp and wet. I saw this little thing. I thought, what is that? And then I realized that it was a little uh, damselfly. I didn't know at the time it was a citrine forktail uh, with its yellow coloration. But I worked and worked probably about 20 minutes or so trying to creep up on this little guy. Each time I thought I would get it into focus, it fly to another stem of grass. Uh, I probably looked like an idiot to the other hikers. I was crawling around on my hands and knees trying to, to uh, track this guy. I finally got um, a halfway decent photo so I could identify what it was later on. Um, here's a beautiful, beautiful damselfly called the Aurora damsel. It's one of the spread wing damsels at rest, rather than have the wings along its abdomen, uh, they fan out like this. And you can't quite see it here, but it has a little yellow patch on its thorax that, that helps identify uh, this. This is the Mountain Empire College. Um, and um, here is one of my favorite photos of a mating wheel of Aurora damsels. I've only seen this once. I was lucky as heck to get a photo because they flew away almost immediately after I snapped this, um, never to be, and went deeper in the woods where I'd never find them again. Uh, but a beautiful um, mating wheel, the heart shape uh, is very clear here. Oops, Fritz. must have company there, Fritzy's. Uh, letting us know. Uh, so this is one of my all time favorite uh, photos I got. Other spread wing damselflies, these are in later fall. They show up around the pond at Mountain Empire, uh, spotted spread wings. And uh, there's a close up of the, uh, um, see the uh, far apart set eyes. Again, the long legs that are used to catch prey when they're flying through the air. Uh, and all, and they're spread wings because they're fanning out their wings at rest, kind of like a damselfly might. Also notice the eyes, again, how in a, a damselfly, they are separated uh, from each other. Uh, that's one of the differences when you see the dragonflies, you'll, you'll note that difference. Um, did find a tandem pair. Uh, first, I thought maybe they're getting ready to mate, and then I realized, no, the male is still grasping the female, but she is laying her eggs. This species, rather than drop eggs into the water, uh, they will cut little slits in the reed, in the stems of the reed, and she'll deposit the eggs uh, in that plant stem. Then when the larva hatch, they'll drop immediately into the water uh, to spend their life cycle uh, underwater. So this was way out. I remember it was quite a distance from the shore. Uh, I just had to kind of hold my camera and line up and take hold my breath and maybe snap a picture. Uh, but uh, turned out I uh, just barely got uh, on the bottom to see the uh, female uh, ovipositing at that point. Pretty neat. Uh, some other nifty spread wings, amber, amber wing uh, spread wing. If you look carefully and see the wings are kind of an amber color rather than clear like so many of them are. Um, here's another uh, spread wing. I think this is a swamp spread wing. I'm not 100%, but that's the closest I could come up with as an ID uh, for this one. Um, and uh, this past summer um, at a Lake uh, Kiyoki, I think it was, uh, uh, outside Big Stone Gap, uh, came across this pair. I can't identify what species, but I thought it was a neat photo. 
uh, out over the water where some uh, lily pad vegetation was, and there was a tandem pair. I'm guessing that uh, they have already made it, and she might be getting ready again to uh, uh, lay some eggs in the stem of that reed. Okay, so that's my damselflies. I can pause a little bit at this point if any of you have any questions at this point. It's, I'd be glad to, uh, you could unmute briefly or um, let me know if there's something that you wanna ask about and then we'll move on to the dragonflies. I've got um, one question, but if somebody else wants to go first, by all means, they should. I'm gonna go first, Erica. Hi, I'm Rob. I, I live with Erica. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, hi rob hey i'm calling i just i just i'm calling i'm i just want to ask a quick question um do dragonflies will they lay their eggs in stagnant water like mosquitoes will uh it well there are some that might lay their eggs like in a vernal pool or uh uh, in a, uh, actually a big, there are some species, I think that, uh, will lay eggs in kind of a wetland area where there's, you know, water can temporarily dry out. And then the, the, uh, larva has to fend for itself under in the mud or something for a while. Um, uh, I'm not sure most of them lay their eggs in ponds, uh, in streams, uh, the ones I was showing, they lay eggs along rivers. It depends a lot on the species. And there, there are some species that they're still trying to learn exactly uh, uh, how they uh, survive under certain circumstances. There's still a lot to be learned about, about them in general. But in terms of just standing water, no, they would need, like they're not gonna lay the eggs in your rain gutters or in, okay. in uh, something like where mosquitoes were because they have to grow, they, they need a bigger food source. Uh, remember, they're gonna get, uh, um, uh, spend two to three years uh, on average in that watery environment and feeding, okay. they need to feed on a variety of, uh, of uh, other uh, critters that might be living in there. All right, so what about you. a hardscaped pond with a recirc pump? <laughs> so I don't know that they may come in and try to lay eggs there, whether they survive uh, that type of uh, thing is another question. Uh, they might be fooled into thinking. I've seen dragonflies try to think the reflection off a car sometimes looks like water, and they'll be coming down thinking they can lay their eggs, uh, you know, on on a automobile or something at at times. So, um, but generally, uh, the ones I know, they're laying their eggs in ponds along rivers, streams. Uh, again, there are some species. Uh, one in particular I'll show you a little bit that uh, seems to uh, lay their eggs in more of a muddy environment like a uh, and uh, and all and how they survive all that I'm not sure good question I have a Any question other? yes yeah um what are their um the greatest predators for them oh that's that's an excellent question well um, they can they can be trapped in large spider webs, especially the smaller damselflies. Uh, a frog would make a meal of them. Uh, a lizard might uh, make a meal of them. Uh, maybe even when they're when they're along the water, a fish could jump out and grab one. I would think birds are probably a good uh, would be a predator uh, mm -hmm. of uh, dragonflies. They really don't have any defenses. They can't sting. They really can't bite. Uh, they rely on their fast flying skills and uh, sometimes maybe a little bit of uh, the females in particular uh, try to blend in more with their environment and not be seen as much, but um, they really have no defensive way. And again, other, other insects uh, will get them. Uh, there are things called robber flies, for example. Uh, a hornet might grab a small damselfly. Um, uh, a mantis could, could grab one. Uh, so they're both, uh, uh, they could be food for invertebrates as well as uh, vertebrate animals. Okay, thank you. The food chain's amazingly complicated and complex and all. It's, it's a very uh, um, striking, all the different things that are going on, particularly with predators out there. Uh, you don't realize all the predator insects that might be uh, in your own backyard or garden at times. Um, I had a bit more of a mechanical question. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if we're talking about the mating claspers, 
Um, is there a difference between the the horizontal uh, grasping appendages and then the the epiproct and the uh, uh, curcus, the the up and down one? Um, yeah, uh, the males generally have three little external parts at the end of their abdomen. Without getting too technical in into all that uh, again male has uh, the slide i'm showing there female only have two and they are made up in such a way that individual species differ and it's almost impossible for one species to mate with a different species because their uh, terminal appendages are designed to fit together in in a particular way it's one um, characteristic of identification of some very uh, similar looking species and all uh, the male, the, the male um, actually produces a sperm at the, from the tip of the abdomen and before they have mated uh, the male has to curl his abdomen around and deposit little sperm uh, packets uh, on that second or third uh, area of the abdomen right behind the thorax uh, so that that takes place even before mating happens um, and then the female uh, parts, uh, when she curls her abdomen around, it has to fit the right kind of, of male part there. Uh, again, uh, each, each species uh, uh, have unique uh, appendages uh, that make it almost impossible for interspecies uh, mating to take place between all the different um, species of even, even the dancers. Uh, each dancer has unique uh, appendages. So they're racist. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but they, they're just designed that way for whatever reason. That's the way they evolved and, and developed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, some of the, I'll, I'll show you, if you're really interested in this, there's some good text. One in particular, I'll show at the end of this talk that you could find in your library or something to get more of the uh, technical uh, details about that. I'm primarily looking at at uh, the uh, the beauty and all the variety of colors at this point. But we could go into that. It's quite an in depth talk to just go into the uh, 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 the mating process in more details. Um, all right, let's move on to our dragonflies. I don't know how I'm doing on time here. I'm not watching that. Um, we'll start with one of the oldest. Uh, species, at least um, according to records and things that have been around longest, uh, this gray petal tail. Uh, this was taken by a friend of mine, uh, Phil Meeks, in the classic position of when they do land, which isn't often, but when they do land, they, they land on, they like to wooden areas, like wooden posts, um, light poles, uh, things, oops. Uh, darn, this thing wants to jump ahead on me. Um, they're also noted, this ticker species is pretty good size. You can, you can see a couple differences. Notice how the big eyeballs almost touch each other on its head. Um, this one, the wings are uh, at rest, are spread outward, um, much thicker body uh, size. And um, one interesting thing about this species is that they seem to enjoy landing on people. Now that can scare some folks. So Phil said he wouldn't didn't, didn't realize what had happened. This thing landed on him first, and he said, "I did a little dance, uh, and uh, glad nobody else was watching." And then it did fly off, and he was able to get a picture of it once he realized what it was. But it was kind of scary when they do fly something this big and lands on you. Again, they can't sting; they won't bite. Uh, in Japan, it's considered good luck and good fortune to have a dragonfly land on you. Uh, so uh, some cultures, uh, again, have uh, uh, great uh, respect for these insects. And, uh, and I know I've had a few land on me, and I think, oh, that's pretty cool. I like that. But um, anyway, uh, this is one of those species that's not a whole lot known about its life cycle, for sure. They, seem, they don't seem to uh, lay their eggs in streams or ponds, but seem to find uh, muddy areas and wetlands, maybe vernal pools. Uh, they may spend quite a bit of time in a dry season, just uh, um, you know, chilling out until it gets wetter and moister. Uh, and uh, there's still um, uh, questions about um, 
uh, how these do survive, but they are found throughout our mountains. I don't know if they're in your end of the state or not, but I know they, they are, uh, they do show up around here from time to time. Um, here is one of the early um, emerging, they will be coming out maybe in April around here, uh, spike tail species. And this is one that I found at Natural Tunnel. We were hiking and I had just happened to look, glance over at a tree uh, near the creek, but it was across the trail from the creek and said, my goodness, that is a dragonfly there. And it's come out. Here is the skin of the nymph. It's crawled up that tree maybe during the night, and this is uh, early morning we were hiking here, and it has come out and is still in the process of pumping the fluid into its wings and expanding out its wings at this point. Uh, the term for that is called teneral. When an, uh, when an insect um, molts and comes out, the true colors haven't really formed at this point in its eyes and other things. And the, the word that describes that is that it's in a tenoral state. Uh, and, and also this is pretty nifty to see, especially amazing that something this long came out of this shell. Um, and all, but again, once it came out, it expanded itself out and it will span maybe a day or so trying to uh, dry out its wings. They're very vulnerable at this time uh, to a uh, bird might come along or something else might come along and, and gobble them up. Um, but um, that's the process of uh, metamorphosis coming out of the water and then transforming itself into the dragonfly after spending maybe several years uh, in the form of the nymph. Uh, here's another photo of it. Uh, same uh, um, spike tail dragonfly. And uh, there's a close up of its head. Again, you can see those big, big eyes that give them such amazing eyesight that they eventually have uh, once it is able to uh, fly off and start trying to find food. Um, a little bit of related to this, uh, we saw the exoskeleton. Uh, made of chitin of insects basically uh, don't have the bones or skeletons. As they grow, they have to uh, shed the outer uh, shell and that's called an exuvia. When an insect or other arthropod will do that, uh, the term is exuvia, the plural exuviae. Uh, and these are a few photos of over the years of exuvia that I found of dragonflies to show what they looked like uh, before uh, they became adults. You know, so that's uh, an interesting term there. Here is a beautiful uh, dragonfly known as a stream cruiser. Very seldom do you get photos of these because they spend most of their time in the air flying. It's very accepted in the evenings when they go up in a tree or, or a secluded area to rest at night. But during the day, they're almost constantly flying up and down the river, up and down the stream. Uh, and uh, this is the only time I've ever found one of these uh, in that was a perch for a little while. I was really happy when I got the photo uh, of this uh, pretty good size uh, dragonfly there. And you see the, uh, uh, the uh, appendages there. Uh, on it. Uh, one of the best known dragonflies uh, species is green darner. Um, they are noted, you may remember one a few years ago, it was all, in all the news in late fall, I think it was 2019, um, and that uh, radars were picking up large uh, flights of what well, they weren't sure what they were at first, and then they realized they were migrating dragonflies. This particular species uh, will sometimes migrate in huge, huge groups of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, uh, large enough groups that they can be picked up on radar. And that happened a few years ago. Um, they're not really sure, don't understand all the process. They evidently fly south 
for the winter. And in smaller groups, they'll be migrating back up north. It won't be long till we'll see uh, them coming from the south into our state and then on up all the way up to Canada. Uh, this species travels quite a distance. Um, and uh, this particular one, uh, you might wonder where the, why the picture here, uh, we were at a blueberry farm up at Pound, Virginia, and uh, the, uh, uh, it got trapped in the netting that was up there to keep the birds away from the blueberries. Well, this one's then somehow gotten in. Uh, I was able to catch it and release it later so it could go out uh, on, on its thing. But uh, these are good size uh, dragonflies, uh, the green darners, and known again for their uh, uh, ability to migrate. Uh, here's a green darner who is that is laying eggs in our pond up at the college where I used to teach. Uh, and she is along the shoreline and is uh, there depositing eggs into the pond. Uh, notice the huge, huge eyes and this little thing in front uh, is a characteristic marking of this of this species. So there, this is one of your larger uh, dragonflies and very common. Uh, throughout the East Coast and all. Uh, this is another darner uh, that is primarily found in the late fall. Uh, this is taking up at High Knob at a festival, the uh, naturalist rally that we had. And I remember it was captured by a student at, at the college at Wise. Uh, they were doing a dragonfly study at that time, uh, about four years ago. And uh, they had netted one because these, again, hardly ever land. They fly around, you rarely see one at rest. Uh, beautiful colorations on these. Uh, a couple years later, I was amazed to find one at rest. This is a male shadow darner, same location up at High Knob in late, uh, uh, I guess early October, maybe the first or second week of October up there. And it was quite cold. We'd already had uh, frost up that point, but they were still flying around on sunny days. A uh, beautiful one, and it just hung there uh, for quite a while and let us get up close and take some photos. Uh, very unusual to find one perched like that. Um, one of my favorite, uh, the colors I think are amazing on there. Here's a close up. Again, the detail of the wings, fascinating. Uh, don't understand why, but that again, that structure of the wings uh, have antimicrobial properties. Uh, that uh, humans are trying to figure out how to how to benefit from that uh, structure and all uh, the huge eyes that they have. Um, uh, this fellow just thought, well, I'll take my picture. I, I'm uh, happy with that. Eventually it flew off and joined some others that were flying all around the uh, lake up there. Uh, this is probably the biggest dragonfly that I've come across. It's known as a dragon hunter. This was in my yard. Look at how long this dude's legs are. My goodness, he can't even figure out where to put the legs. They're so long. Um, the name dragon hunter is a common name, comes from the fact that this species is notorious for catching other species of dragonflies as its main source of food. Uh, they are ferocious. And I actually saw one one time uh, take down a smaller dragonfly in midair. It's fascinating to see, and it flew off way up in the tree. I couldn't get a photo, but uh, it was incredible to see that uh, that happening. Uh, the interesting thing about this picture, look at the tip of the wing up here uh, on the upper right. Uh, there's some kind of little fly. It may be a robber fly, maybe a dance fly that decided to take a little rest on the wing of this dude. I didn't even know it was there until after I processed the uh, photo at that time. But these are uh, magnificent uh, uh, dragonflies. The bright yellow and black colors, the green eyes, uh, they have a little bend in the abdomen. Uh, they're, they're related to what are called club tails. Uh, and long legs uh, are fascinating. You can see why they catch all kinds of, of uh, big prey as they fly around. Um, here's another dragon hunter. This is Natural Tunnel Park, and this was fortuitous. We do a program called Junior Naturalist for kids there. Uh, had to be discontinued during pandemic, but I just done, did a program on dragonflies, and then we went for a little hike, and lo and behold, we find this big dude uh, hanging there. You know, uh, incredible uh, fortune to see him. 
Uh, here's to give you an idea of the size that I am holding him. You can see how uh, large that uh, particular species uh, is. Uh, and this is what they look like as a nymph. We actually fish this out near at, up at Natural Tunnel. We did a thing on what's in the stream and did some netting and collecting with the kids. And one of these guys came out and this is a medium size at this point uh, nymph. It probably has a couple more years before it gets full grown and would come out as an adult uh, dragon hunter, damsel flyer. Really odd looking uh, critter to find uh, in your water. Uh, other interesting uh, club tails, uh, this is called the splendid club tail, um, landed on a uh, stone path. In front of us here is a lancet club tail, I think. I'm not 100% sure, so I put it might be the ashy club tail there. So uh, close to each other, you almost have to get a magnifying glass out sometimes to look and identify which species it might be. I can't tell entirely from the photo at this point. Um, here's a very pretty fellow. This landed on my butterfly net at the Cedars in Lee County. We were doing a butterfly hike at the time, and one of the hikers yelled at me, said, Mr. Allgaier, you've got a, a dragonfly on your net, and it came and landed there. It didn't stay very long, but I was able to get a picture uh, of this uh, pretty fellow. Uh, here's another one that uh, I've seen a few times. This is in our yard on a tansy plant. They seem to like fern plants as well. Uh, interesting uh, shimmery colors uh, on this called a black shouldered spiny leg. Uh, pretty good size. Again, they have very spiny legs, obviously, for catching uh, prey. Um, here's another one uh, that we found on a hike on a fern. Uh, they seem to prefer, when I found these, they, they seem to be on uh, uh, vegetation like that when they do decide to land. Uh, saddlebags are interesting uh, critters. A little smaller than the ones we've seen before. This is up in a branch of a tree. Hard to get a good angle on it. Uh, you can see his legs there as he's grasping the, the uh, end of the twig. Here's another picture, same fella. Uh, the saddlebags come from the lower wings having this type of pattern. Somebody gave it a name and said it looks like a saddle or something, and, and somehow or other that became the common name uh, for this species. Uh, there's also a Carolina saddlebags that has more of a bronzy orange uh, tint to the uh, wings. Um, again, interesting uh, coloration on uh, this, this fella. Um, common whitetails. Uh, these are found throughout the state, I think, and they are fairly common and they do seem to like to pose for pictures. They aren't as skittish as some other species. Uh, they get their name. This is a male. Only the males have this white tail and it develops over time. Uh, when they first come out, they don't have this white marking. And uh, as they get older and older, the abdomen be uh, becomes what's called pruinose uh, in coloration. And you have this distinctive uh, common name for of the white tail. Uh, they are very interesting. They'll fly quite a distance sometimes from the water source. You'll see them in your yards uh, in a variety of locations. Uh, here's a female. Her wing pattern is different. If you look at the wing pattern here, the male again, and then compare the female has different wing pattern. That's kind of unusual uh, with the markings. Also her abdomen, while she has some white spots there, her abdomen will never get entirely white uh, like the male uh, white tail. Uh, here is another female. I think they are very pretty. And again, they like to pose for pictures, it seems. Uh, most of these are taken in Lee County at a nature preserve called the Cedars, a very uh, pleasant area to hike around. Uh, here's a male white tail, but he doesn't have the white tail yet because he's very young. Uh, again, um, the uh, dragonflies will change color over time. And so this, um, I know it's a male because of the pattern on the wings. It's a male wing pattern, but uh, he's immature in the sense that he hasn't developed the, the white whiteness of his abdomen yet. Lovely, lovely uh, creature. Uh, similar looking um, 
dragonfly is the widow skimmer. Uh, the male here shown with the black markings on the wings and then the white uh, middle area of the wings. Uh, that's the way you distinguish the male of the species. Here's another male. This one's older. Notice the abdomen has uh, become again, pruinose or very white uh, in nature and all. Um, striking find these. these. These actually showed up in my yard again, uh, uh, quite a distance from some of the water sources. Uh, this is a female uh, found up at uh, UVA Wise in Wise, Virginia. Notice her, uh, she doesn't have the white in the middle of the wings here, it's a little bit different, and her abdomen is uh, interesting colored there and we kind of reflects light a little bit. Uh, pretty uh, dragonfly. One of my favorites to find midsummer up the Pond of Mountain Empire are the spangled skimmers. I love the white spangles on the wings that will reflect sunlight and are very striking when they fly. You can see the little glitter off their wings and they can be spotted from quite a distance if the sun is reflecting uh, in that way. Uh, that's, so that's one of my uh, favorite species to run across usually uh, in um, July is when I run across them here. Uh, here's another one, uh, such a very, the intricacies of the wings I think is, is amazing uh, as well as the ability. And this is one that likes to perch or rest. So you'll often find them uh, in a position where you can easily get uh, nice photos of them. Uh, this one is very hard to photograph, a wandering glider. They, they're, they're well named because they wander all over the place. They very seldom land and they very seldom stay in one place at one time. This is a species that likes to uh, um, go from place to place uh, and migrate some. They'll, they'll uh, migrate great distances at times. Uh, and all. This particular one, I remember it was early morning, the grass was still wet. I saw it kind of gone along the grass. I didn't know what it was at the time, but uh, it did keep landing. Every time I tried to get up close to get a photo, it would fly a little distance, but again, it would land again. I didn't notice till later the, the nice little yellow markings here on the tips of the wings. I think that's uh, an interesting uh, adaptation that they have and uh, a very subtle colorations on them. Um, I've seen a few others, but I've never seen one land uh, except for this guy. Uh, Eastern pond hawks are a beautiful, beautiful species. And this is one case where I think the females are have a pretty coloration, prettier coloration than the male of the species. Uh, although it is a bright green that blends in very nicely and camouflages with green plants as well. Uh, but this uh, green coloration, I think, is pretty nifty uh, with the black markings. And again, they can, if you don't uh, see them in flight, you could easily walk by this and not recognize that there is a dragonfly uh, in that patch of green. But uh, when they fly and land, that tips you off that, that they are around there. Uh, they like to perch on the ends of twigs. Uh, here's another one. Uh, they're, they're pretty common around here um, in midsummer. And uh, here's the male. The male is very pretty. Uh, he has a very subtle kind of greenish uh, marking on the thorax, but the body is, uh, is blue and a very handsome fella. But again, I think the coloration of the females in this particular species outdo uh, the male coloration. Uh, here's another female, and this is an interesting pose here that you'll see among perching um, that they will, on very hot days, they will perch and point their abdomen toward the sun. Oops. Uh, it's called obelisking. Sometimes they'll point it straight up if it's 12 noon or so. Uh, and that is thought to be a way to prevent overheating. Now, most of the time they like sunlight because they are cold blooded, they need to warm up, but on a very hot day, they don't wanna overheat. And so they strike this pose, it's called an obelisk pose or obelisking, interesting a word there uh, to add to your vocabulary. Um, here is a tenoral 
eastern pond hawk early in the morning. This is just recently emerged and, and its wings still aren't dry. It kind of fluttered along the grass. I saw it and uh, got up and, and took a picture, but it was very uh, uh, tentative flight at this point because the wings weren't ready to full, fully uh, fly uh, quick and fast. Uh, they just kind of fluttered along the ground. It's still in the process of drying out uh, it, her wings. Um, probably the camera hog of all dragonflies are blue dashers. For whatever reason, they love to pose for people. They will come in, and this one's striking the typical obelisking pole male. These are small little dragonflies. They're not real big. Here's one that's uh, older. You can tell by the white abdomen that he's gotten prunios or prunosity is called. Uh, well, that's a blue dash and they'll often perch and you go up and they may fly away, but they'll come right back and they'll look at you and say, take my picture. So uh, I've got a lot of photos of blue dashers over the years. Uh, here's the females. You don't see them quite as often. They're a little more secretive. Uh, but there's a blue dasher female. Notice she doesn't have the blue coloration and she has red eyes rather than the blue eyes of the male. Uh, here's another uh, female, a little bit older female. She's obelisking, got her wings folded forward and pointing her abdomen up toward the sun on a hot day. Uh, comparison of the size of blue mud dauber wasp on the left, give you an idea of the comparative size of a blue dasher. This was on a fence post by the uh, pond. And a female that I'd netted to examine a little more closely. And then when I let her out of the net, she hung around on the tip of my finger for a while and decided to stare at me. And I thought, well, I'll get a photo here. And so there's a blue dasher uh, giving me the evil eye uh, before she flew away. Uh, and I've once I uh, this couple of years ago, I finally found a mating wheel of blue dashers. Uh, it didn't last very long, but they were on a lily pad, and uh, I was able to quickly get this in focus and snap a picture before they they uh, flew off and all. Um, that's uh, interesting. Again, the uh, pose uh, female is, or is being clasped by the male, uh, and she's been around to. Uh, uh, get the uh, sperm packet from, from the male. Uh, there's some red dragonflies out there. This is a ruby meadowhawk, a uh, very colorful, brightly colored species. Um, here's another one. Uh, I think they're very pretty, uh, delicate wings, bright red and black bodies. Here's one obelisking. Uh, pretty neat pictures there. I'm running out short on time. I guess I need to move along a little bit. Uh, ruby meadowhawks, uh, again, um, they, they seem to show up every couple of years up at Mountain Empire. They're not ever there every season. So I don't know if it takes a while for them to, to uh, again, the larvae uh, spend several years before they come out as adults. And they may be in a cycle that I don't seem to find them every year. But when they are there, they're striking to find. You know, uh, slaty skimmers are very common flying around the ponds, uh, along with blue dashers. Uh, we see lots and lots of them. It's a perching species. Uh, here's another one, uh, the slate color and marking the wings kind of give them away uh, in terms of identification. The females look quite looking, uh, quite different. Excuse me. This is a tenoral female recently emerged. Uh, her coloration hasn't really taken place yet. It has, she hasn't fully developed all of her colors and her wings are still wet and need to dry out some. Um, here's a, a slaty skimmer where the light is hitting his wings. He's been around for a while. Notice the one wing has some nicks in it. Don't know what caused that. Uh, maybe a bird, maybe uh, just uh, something or other, but uh, it, he could still fly reasonably well and like the uh, sunlight hitting the wings uh, off the uh, Interesting pattern again of the veins of the wings. In comparison, here's a blue dasher and the slaty skimmer. They were playing, kind of playing king of the mountain there. They kept fighting over the top spot on this reed and would fly back and forth and kind of chase each other around. You know, then they both land and kind of say, okay, you can have that spot for a while, but then they fly off and start battling a little bit again. Uh, slaty skimmer mating wheel. 
uh, out on the uh, pond. Again, the uh, classic pose that's there. Uh, some other recent dragonflies I've found, the calico pennant, very colorful. Just came across this this past summer. Uh, first time I've added that to my collection. I like the both the markings on the abdomen and the very interesting colorations on the wings of, of this species. Um, a banded pennant. I've only seen one of these. When I tried to move around to get another angle of the photo, it flew off never to be seen again. I'm hoping to find uh, this species again sometime. And this is a very striking dragonfly, the 12 spotted skimmer, the male here has beautiful white and black markings on the wings for the 12 spots. Uh, and if you count the black spots, you can count 12 of them. Um, and uh, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous uh, insect. Here's another photo that I got of the same insect from another angle. It flew around and perched a few times for some uh, very nice photos. Uh, late fall, you'll find uh, the autumn meadowhawks. These are very small. Uh, very brightly colored, and you'll see them, at least around here, I'll see them even maybe in early November. They still might be hanging around on a warm day. Uh, here's one on, on a wood. They, they uh, are fairly easy to move up upon and snap some pictures of. Uh, here's a female, not as brightly colored, more of a, of a, a rusty brownish coloration to the female. Uh, here's a, a tandem pair. Uh, that was on a rock with some lichen, I guess, on. I thought that was an interesting position. I don't know. Again, they may have mated. They may be ready to mate. I'm really not sure uh, at that point. I did capture this same day. They were all over the place. I remember because I was in between committee meetings of Mountain Empire. I said, I got to get away from this. I've had two committee meetings. I got two more. I took a break, walk up to the pond, and these were all over the place on that particular day and mating was going on uh, out over the water. Here's a mating wheel of the uh, autumn meadow hawks. And my final picture, another uh, mating wheel of the autumn meadow hawks as they continue on. It's a uh, fun species to find. Uh, I even had them landing on me at times. So uh, hopefully that brought me some good luck. All righty, well, that concludes the thing. I'm not sure on time. I probably ran over. Yep, I went about 10 minutes longer than I thought. Uh, if you're interested in dragonflies and damselflies, uh, the best field guide, I think, is this book by Dennis Paulson. Um, it has wonderful information. I'm still learning so much. I'm not an expert on these guys by any means, uh, but I'm trying to learn. Um, for insects in general, on the web, uh, Google Bug Guide. It's a fantastic site of all types of insects. It's my go-to place when I'm trying to identify any kind of insects. There are some good Facebook groups that I've learned a lot from. In particular, I highly recommend Virginia Odonata on Facebook if you're interested in seeing more and learning more. Uh, a great group of people. I sometimes post photos when I'm not sure what I found and uh, get some expert help from the uh, people who run that site. And I'll put my email up here again. My name is Chris Allgaier, and I'm happy to uh, uh, reply to any uh, queries or information about any kind of insect uh, that you might want to ask me about. I like getting pictures from other people and, and again, learning about bugs and insects. So sorry I went a little long. Um, hope I still got some people there. The one thing about doing a Zoom is you never know what the audience is doing when you're doing that. So I'm going to uh, leave that up for a little bit. But again, I'll take any questions and uh, anything that you want to ask or, or uh, do. I'll try my best to uh, to answer. Thank you very much for your time and expertise. <laughs> Uh, let's open it up. Do we have any other questions from the audience? What uh, I have one. What uh, type of camera are you using? Right. What lens? Oh my God. Okay. Well, oh, I've yeah. got, <clears throat> I've got an. Uh, it's a point and shoot, but it's a pretty sophisticated one. It's a Nikon N ninety. Uh, I do have some SLR, but I find that by the time I try 
to focus or do things with those, sometimes it's, it's tedious. So uh, I've, I'm not a real expert photographer, um, but this uh, particular one allows me to quickly zoom. It has a feature that I can zoom in a hurry uh, to get a close up. And that's important when you're doing flying insects, whether it's butterflies, uh, which I do a lot of butterfly photography and uh, smaller insects that are flying around. Uh, I've gotten into robber flies as well. And so you, you only have a few seconds sometimes before the insect realizes you're there and, and flies off. So uh, the, 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 uh, there are a variety of cameras. There's some better uh, things that the people have more expertise than I have, but uh, this is a Nikon, uh, the model number, it's called an N90 or something. I think that's the name of it. And uh, cool, yeah, cool picks. Oh, no, it's not N90, it's P900. Cool picks P900 uh, is what I'm using. Um, again, uh, real camera experts can probably do better than I have, but I haven't mastered all the uh, intricacies of, of the... Uh, SLR fancier cameras. So this is basically a point and shoot, but uh, it focuses autofocus pretty well. And um, uh, sometimes I get lucky. You haven't seen all the photos that are that are crummy that I've taken. Um, so well, uh, these are pretty good. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I enjoy uh, my my goal is not as much as the art, uh, and you folks as artists uh, could probably do. Uh, better with some of these things. Uh, my goal is really to get uh, identifiable characteristics of them as best I can. Although sometimes uh, uh, the insect world uh, you know, will provide the the art, whether I can appreciate it or not, it's there. And, uh, hopefully I've inspired you a little bit to think about uh, these are beautiful creatures. I think uh, the vast variety of colors, the in intricacies of their wings, um and all they look kind of scary maybe to some folks but they're not and they play such an important role uh in our environment i was saying earlier they they serve as a, kind of a monitor of water quality if you see dragonflies around that's good that means the water quality is such that they have the uh, critters that they can live underwater and find other critters to feed on and then when they're out uh, they can come around and be feeding on insects and, and a variety of flying bugs. The uh, fact that they eat mosquitoes ought to make them uh, uh, everyone's favorite, I think. I well. love that. <laughs> you know, uh, I didn't mention that, you know, the one species that migrates. I don't know if you've ever witnessed it or not, but a few years ago when those uh, green darners were migrating, uh, we had a huge number of them come into our yard about five o'clock in the evening uh, and they were just flying all over the yards, hundreds of them uh, in our, above our garden and, uh, you know, catching things because that time of year you have a lot of little flying gnats and things that come up and are flying around, uh, around sunset and things, who knows that. And it was amazing just to see them uh, zipping around, changing directions, uh, grabbing everything they could. Uh, while they were, I guess, stoking up so they could uh, continue their migration the next day. But uh, that's a fascinating thing if you're able, lucky enough to witness it sometime. And I think a lot of them were coming down the east coast of Virginia. I think I saw people commenting about seeing huge numbers of, of uh, dragonflies that one year. It doesn't happen every year. They migrate every year, but you seem to get these huge mass migrations appearing uh, every so many years. And they really don't understand why. They're still trying to figure out what, why is it happening in that way with this species. They're almost all uh, darners um, that are doing this. But So there's a lot to learn still out there. Amazing. Are there, does anybody else have any other questions? Well, th thank you so much, Chris, for your time and helping us do this. And well, you're welcome. I'm glad we still have some people there. I was afraid I would have, you know, gone a little bit long. I've lost a lot of you. So I appreciate all of you uh, joining us. If you're ever out in far southwest Virginia, please come to Big Stone Gap. You got uh, it. <laughs> 
we have a lot of beautiful parks around our region and hiking areas. We also are home to the official Virginia outdoor drama, the Trail of the Lonesome Pine uh, that oh runs God. every summer. It's a wonderful story by John Fox Jr., who was the uh, local author here who uh, wrote that uh, novel. And uh, it's all amateur production. I mean, it's just community production. I've been going on uh, uh, for, for over 50 years. And um, uh, we'd love to have you come out and see uh, our beautiful area and uh, uh, take in some of the uh, uh, things that we have to offer. Big Stone Gap has five museums. A uh, little town of that we have, we have uh, the uh, Southwest Vir Virginia Museum, which is a state park, uh, June Tolliver House, John Fox House, have a coal mining museum, uh, and uh, it's, uh, and we've got some pretty good eating places now, we're, we're uh, uh, doing some, some neat things out here, so once the pandemic settles down and people can get out and travel around, why come out our way. Sounds what good is the, so the outdoor outdoor performances is that what yeah. you're saying? Yeah, it's an outdoor drama. It takes outdoor place in the drama. summer. It's an outdoor stage. Um, and if you're familiar with outdoor dramas, we are the longest running outdoor drama in the Commonwealth, and we're designated the official Commonwealth outdoor drama by an act of the uh, legislature uh, a few years back. Uh, so it's a it's a uh, fun story. A uh, nice romantic uh, fun story for lots of traditional mountain music as part of the uh, story. And if you've never read the book, The Trail of Lonesome Pine, uh, at the time it was written, which is a turn in the 19th century around um, by John Fox Jr., it was the one of the first books to sell a million copies. This is way back in the early 1900s when it was written. John Fox Jr. hardly anybody knows him now, but at the time he was the, the one of the best known authors uh, in the uh, country. And he wrote The Little Shepherd of Kingdom Come. You may have heard of that story as well. There's, and Kentucky has a Kingdom Come uh, State Park that's uh, uh, related to uh, his other famous novel. So anyway, it's it's fun thing. We're we're on the Crooked Road. If you're into traditional mountain music, um, the Ukulele Fest is going to be uh, yeah. just north yeah. of here in two weeks, and I got tickets right. already. Okay, well we've got some big big things coming up uh, musically as well in our area. So uh, again, traditional uh, mountain music, some bluegrass, and some other uh, uh, things. It's uh, it surprised it surprised me when I moved to this area. Uh, 50 years ago and, and saw all the things that were happening in this little community. Oh, cool. So, well, I howdy, wish Captain. you, yeah, I wish you, yeah, Captain Tuttle's back here now. Say hi, Captain. Um, I wish you well with your flora and fauna. It sounds like you have a wonderful program uh, going on and uh, uh, hopefully I've had add a little bit to your uh, thoughts about uh, what's going on in nature and as artists you might be inspired some by some of the uh, uh, critters that you saw and think about uh, uh, maybe you using them in some of your artistic uh, works and also absolutely thank you thank, thank you, you so, so much, much. Thank and you're you welcome so much have a wonderful evening and okay thank you thank you I've, i enjoyed it very much nice meeting you all